Welcome everyone to 22 Minutes in Lending. I'm your host, Vince Passione, and I'm happy to introduce Gary Lewis, Managing Director of Lending and Deposit Solutions at Jack Henry. Gary joined Jack Henry in 2012, and one of his current responsibilities is overseeing the strategy to eliminate duplication and improve efficiencies at the firm. This includes the task of consolidating 11 lending systems under a single market strategy. It's a pleasure to welcome Gary as a guest on today's podcast. So let's get started with these 22 Minutes in Lending. Gary, welcome, and thanks for joining me. Appreciate the opportunity. Glad to be here. Past two years have been a pretty rough ride for both banks and credit unions. We saw about 11 interest rate hikes in about 18 months. We saw five bank failures in 2023, and deposit growth came to a, a screeching halt and started reversing very, very quickly. So how did Jack Henry navigate through the past two years? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I think the last two years is, is just an extension going all the way back to COVID. Right. So, I mean, if we think back, you know, it was kind of the opposite problem when COVID hit, uh, you know, liquidity flooded the market. There was a lot of government programs flooded a lot of cash into the market. Loan demand went in the tank, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, you know, as that liquidity was absorbed, as the programs ran out, you know, then we come into, uh, you know, a, a pretty robust heated economy and then the liquidity dries up. Uh, you know, things start changing, right? So the shift moves away from trying to push all that money out on the street in the form of loans into, holy moly, how do we fund the demand that we have today as our liquidity is dried up? So um, it's been a real challenge, uh, not going to lie. Um, the one thing I always say is is these are market cycles, right? We, we go through it, but some of them we create, some of them are, are natural, you know, with the COVID and the government programs, et cetera, that, that kind of artificially inflated some of those things, in my opinion. Uh, but, you know, as we cycle through that, the pendulum's going to swing the other way. Right now, I feel like, you know, we're kind of at the bottom of the liquidity uh, trough, so to speak. Uh, banks are scrambling, credit unions are scrambling to, to fund those, uh, those loans that they have, that, you know, the demand that they have. And unfortunately, that probably limits their ability to really expand and grow those portfolios or expand the types of lending they want to do, uh, just trying to take care of their current base that they have today. Yeah. So Gary, my opening, we talked about consolidating, you know, 11 platforms, lending platforms. You said you probably have other platforms as well into a single platform. What was the strategy behind that? Was that in reaction to what's happening in the market that you, that Jack Henry felt like there was going to be some type of, of compression in the market? Talk to us about that. Yeah, no, it, it really is a separate, um, a separate strategy more defined by the expectations of the, the borrower or the depositor. Um, you know, today's uh, experience, the expectation of that end user, and I'm not talking about the financial institution, I'm talking about their customers, you know, that experience should should equal what what they do every day on their phone, right? That, that's what they they become comfortable with. If you think about the Amazons or you think about, you know, any of the different type of applications, that's how people are doing business. You know, that's why, uh, you know, the large chains are moving to a, a digital uh, option as well. Well, the, the banking and credit union segment, all financial institutions are trying to figure out where their place is in that world, right? Fintechs have come in, alternative lenders have come in, you got your traditional uh, banks, your traditional credit unions, and really the, the, the credit union space, traditional financial institution space, they've focused on that relationship, right? And, and unfortunately, that relationship has lost its power to some degree. It's still there, but as, as the as the clients age, as the new age folks come in, they want that new modern technology, that new feel. And, you know, financial institutions are struggling a little bit to really identify their place there. Now, surveys will show that if they can get close, if they can get close on the experience level, people would prefer to work with their local institutions because they probably know people there, right? So they want to do it. They just don't want to be crippled by poor technology. So our strategy going back a few years was to look at all the functionality we provided, right? Set the technology to the side. Here's all the functionality we provide. How do we take that functionality and bring it to our customers, our financial institutions in a manner that their customers want, right? That's been the real strategy. Now, 
what's accelerated that has been obviously COVID kicked off, you know, you couldn't even go into a financial institution for a long time. So that kicked off this electronics uh, modernization, let's say, uh, in the financial institution space. And, and, and they're really trying to play catch up now. So, you know, are we ahead of the game? Absolutely not. I think we and everybody else are behind trying to catch up to what we're used to on the phone. And, and we'll get there. And once we do get there, we set the standard for how financial business should be done. Uh, and then, then that relationship, in my opinion, starts feeding back in. And if I can give them equal technology to work with their customers, the customers will be more sticky in their shops. Gary, just to pull on the thread a little bit about deposits and being local. So when I was listening to Brian Moynihan at a conference in Chicago, and he was talking about his experience in, in sort of going digital and reducing the branch footprint. We saw in the Wall Street Journal, right, that Jamie Dimon at J.P. Morgan Chase is committing to open 500 new branches. And all of a sudden you see even the folks at B of A now, right, they're starting to rebound and increase their branch footprint. Part of your responsibility is deposit strategies as well. The data shows, I think it does, that that having that footprint is helpful. It's it's expensive, but it's helpful. Are you seeing some of the same things? And, and what role do you play when you think about the technology that goes into the branch itself? Because we talk about being digital and most people feel like, okay, you're home, right? But, but how does that how does that translate when I when I walk into the branch? Yes, that's a that's a fantastic question. So first off, I will say extremes of anything are probably not good, right? So when we make these huge swings and say we're going to get out of the branch business and we're going to do everything digital, or we're not going to adopt digital, we're going to focus on the local relationship. It, either one of those is is going to isolate, right? It, it it has to be a blend of everything, and and it's. There is a time and place for every interaction. And our technology, specifically what I'm focusing on with that user experience that we talk about, is no matter where you are, in your car, in front of your TV, in the branch parking lot, before you walk in, you know, you're trying to do things, right? And you're in the middle of an application, let's say, and you get stuck for whatever reason, and you whip into a branch. You need to be able to walk in and sit down with a person at that facility and pick up right where you left off, right? You're not starting over. They know where you are and that experience is solid. And, and, you know, we kind of coined that, you know, that we meet the need at the time and place it's required. Um, and you use technology to do that. You know, it's not, you don't use technology to replace people. You use technology to enhance people. You don't use technology to replace relationships. You use them to enhance relationships. And that's, that's the beauty of properly deployed technology is it can make your really smart, expensive people that are in your facilities valuable, more valuable than without the technologies. Right. Now, agreed. Agreed. And I, I think that that I always say consumers don't just want ch one channel. They want every channel. Optionality. Optionality is the word I use every time. Yep. I would agree. I would agree. So we roll into 2024, and I think there's, there was certainly the recent Fed survey of, of loan officers in, in, in banks and credit unions is they're a bit more optimistic. But when we look at the backdrop, right, credit's still tightening um, in the fourth quarter. Liquidity, when I look at the last, the last numbers for credit unions at least, uh, I think a loan to share was about a little over 86%, which at least in my, my tenure seems to be at, at a record high. What, what do you think? What are you hearing from your clients? I mean, we have credit unions in the audience listening to this. What are you hearing as you go out and talk to clients about how they feel about, you know, 2024 and the things they walked out of that strategy session with and, and where they're heading? Yeah. So again, I'm not an economist, but I tend to play one sometimes, but, uh, you know, everybody was talking about the recession and then it was going to be a soft landing. And then now they're like, it's so soft. We didn't hardly feel it you know, et cetera. And I think that's probably true. Um, you know, most everyone had had built in and, and accounted for a reduction in Fed rates recently, and that did not happen. Um, so, you know, everybody's kind of like, oh, okay, they're going to 
going to hold us up a little bit more, you know. But but again, just the the discussion of that happening, you probably are going to start feeling that ease a little bit. That rate pressure starting to come down a little bit. You know, that'll drive down your cost of funds. That'll create more lending opportunities. That'll drive, you know, it'll it'll start pushing more more uh, liquidity back into the traditional market versus you know into into uh, different things such as treasuries, et cetera. So, you know, my, I believe we're on that cusp of starting to ease up just a little bit. Um, and and I think financial institutions need to kind of plan for that. And and I said it earlier. You know, it's really about having a good strategy, a long-term strategy with with tools in your pocket to help deal with these drastic swings that happen, right? And I think if you if you have that long-term strategy and you know you define it, then you're not wandering on your way to a destination. You know where you're going. And sometimes you may come up on a roadblock that you have to deal with, but you stay true to that strategy and head that direction. So understanding what, who you want your clients to be, what types of growth you want, what you want your year over year lending growth to be, and then what categories, what kind of deposit growth are you trying to secure and, and with who, you know, so that you really lay in those strategies out so that you're not always reacting to whatever the shiny object is today. So, Gary, one of the things that we see and hear, right, is our clients have to had to suddenly turn around and think of different ways to fund these loans. You know, up until recently, I don't remember hearing about the Federal Home Loan Bank in credit union land. And now when I go out and talk to clients, it's it's typically one of the things we we eventually start talking about. And we had Steve Williams from Cornerstone Advisors on, and we started going back and forth about credit unions are really return on asset kind of lenders, and now they have to become return on equity types of lenders. What do you think about that? And what role do you think, you know, I always contemplate what role we play. What role does Jack Henry play in helping their clients understand different ways they might leverage their balance sheet as we think about deposits, lending, and then what about this other pool of capital, brokered CDs, right? Going to the Federal Home Loan Bank to fund that. Yeah, to me, it's it's back to optionality. Again, you know, we talk about it at the, the individual consumer level, but, you know, financial institutions have to do the exact same thing. They have a business to run. You know, back in the day, it was overnight Fed funds, right? That's what that's all you used. And, and then, you know, then you went through the, the stage of the, the expanding use of the Federal Home Loan Bank and then, Brokered CDs. I, I mean, I've been in those institutions. I I know how those things work. They all come with a price, right? You know, some of them better than others, uh, and and depending, uh, you know, on your need at the time, the situation you're in, um, you know, you have to you have to pull all those levers, in, in my opinion. Um, and I hate to always keep coming back to strategy, but again, if you have a if you have a good long term strategy. You might have to dip into those different pools at various points in time, but it shouldn't be where you reside, if that makes sense. You should you should always be be measured in your approach uh, on on how you're using those because I just to me I just consider those financial tools that are available to credit unions, to to banks, et cetera, to help manage and uh, their balance sheet, um, and and that's the that's the criticality to the the strategy um, that. You you want to be able to dip in and out without having to live in there, if that makes sense. Because right, it, no, it, it, I like. I mean, it's debt, right? So I mean, it, it, you know, you get married to debt. If you think about your own individual balance sheet, you get too married to debt, then you kind of limit your flexibility on what you can do going forward. Yeah, it's interesting. We saw that the NCUA issued a letter to credit unions about what their what their focus will be in examination twenty twenty four. And and no surprise, right? Obviously, interest rate risk, but liquidity risk was one of the bigger things that they that they cited uh, as they sent that out. Which means, okay, this exam cycle, right? This NEV test, right? How much exposure you have to longer term fixed rate assets is going to be part of the test. But your opinion? Do you think the NCUA is going to do what the controller of the currency has done for larger banks, which is sort of mandate liquidity requirements for them? Uh think they should. 
um, you know, that, uh, if you're going to have uh, an oversight capacity over an industry, I think you have to establish rules from which that industry fall, follows. Um, so, so yes, you know, if they're going to, to allow, uh, you know, expansion and, and lending opportunities, that obviously is going to lead to additional risk. The number one offset to risk in a lending portfolio is the capitalization of your institution. So, I mean, yeah, I, in my opinion, I think they almost have to, uh, if they're going to continue to broaden the, the, uh, options that those institutions have to put money out on the street. Yeah. So let's switch gears. I was listening to one of your, your previous interviews and we talked, you were talking about PPP. Yeah. Right. right. And uh, it's interesting, right? You know, so, so the government steps in, there's no, there's no channel to deliver this money, but they, right. They make it available. And, and obviously Jack Henry and a bunch of other fir firms, right. Stepped up and, and provide the plumbing, right, to deploy all that capital. And then we roll forward. And obviously now every, you, you know, small business lending is sort of really tightened up. Um, and the question now is, all right, at this point, that's the way we're gonna drive the economy, right? These smaller businesses getting back on their feet, right? Trying to get working capital loans, expand. What, what's, what's the role of Jack Henry and small business lending? What are you hearing and seeing from your clients, right? When they're building these kind of portfolios, I often feel that credit unions are in it, but not in as large as maybe some of the banks are in it. Yeah. So, um, again, I'm a big, big, big fan of the small business industry. Um, you know, and I, I, I don't want to get hung up on SBA because that is a piece of funding for small business as opposed to just all small business in general and how they're funding their industry. Um, you know, and, and traditionally, you know, they've done it by their bootstraps. I mean, quite honestly, you know, they, they, they go around and they figure out how they can fund their industry and there's so many options for them. Again, I think the FinTechs coming into the space and again, Jack Henry's we're a large company, but we are considered a FinTech. But, you know, those fintechs coming in that solved a single problem, they really created a lot of disruption in a traditional lending environment. So, um, uh, you know, if you, if you just think about the, uh, the, the folks that come in and do the, the, uh, merchant cash, uh, funding or the folks that are doing receivable funding or, you know, uh, all the buy now, pay later stuff that's in place today, you know, all those things. Very few of those things are being driven by a traditional community financial institution. They're all fintechs doing one specific thing really, really well, but it is filling the need of that small business. It's helping them get the funding they need because, again, most larger financial institutions tend to be reactionary. So when rates go up, it, you know, they kind of they kind of squeeze it off a little bit, right? Uh, their liquidity starts getting tight. Well. Can't loan any money, right? And it's 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 an on or off tap. It's not, hey, over the next six months we're going to slow this thing down. It's literally like, rates go up, we stop. You know, I mean, it just happens like that. And a small business is just crippled when that happens. If all of a sudden any opportunity they had to get funding is gone, then they're just crippled overnight. So that really opened the door for all of these uh, fintechs to come in, all these alternative lenders to come in. And they've done a great job of filling that void. Now, the, the real challenge is how, how does the traditional financial institution get back in that space the right way? And they're going to have to do it with technology. Um, you know, they're not going to just, just tomorrow decide we're going to go do, you know, uh, uh, accounts receivable lending, right? I mean, that's a, that's a cultural uh, challenge for a lot of institutions. They, it's an intangible, right? It is an asset, but it's in the air, right? It's as opposed to a piece of real estate or a piece of equipment or something like that. So that creates a challenge for them culturally. So we have to create and utilize technology to help them be more comfortable lending in that asset space to open up that funding channel for small business. And and that just repeats itself regardless of the different type you're, you're doing, whether it's it's, you know, looking at, at uh, restaurants, for example, were some of the, the largest users of, of the merchant uh, strategy. 
you know, to do that because they could just see what their receipts were and they could turn that into instant cash off their credit card receipts. So it was just things like that is what we're going to have to deliver from a technology standpoint to allow these institutions to, to be the good partner locally that they used to be and that that's kind of been siphoned off of them today. Yes, yeah, wonderful. I want to go back and, and just pull on this a little bit further. So in, in, you talk about niche niches in, in in the discussions you've had in niche lending and, you know, whether it's buy now, pay later or medical lending or cash advances. And, and certainly when we think about fintechs in general and not not large established firms, but but new firms, right? New firms are just getting started. Firms that are go out, going out to venture firms are getting seed financing. You're right. They tend to be product companies. They find a niche. They hyper focus on it. They disrupt it using technology, and then they prove to I think the larger institutions, right, that that technology really can change the way the product is delivered. And when I think about Jack Henry and innovation, how does that when you see that happen, right? You see a a small sort of nascent company come into the space and start exploiting technology and sometimes taking risk, right? How, how do you innovate, right, at Jack Henry that way? Yeah, so there's, that's a that's a twofold question. So first off, I will say, you know, at Jack Henry, we have a philosophical uh, position that we want to have open technology, okay? And what that means is, is we don't have a closed ecosystem. We don't, you don't just use Jack Henry stuff, so to speak. Uh, when I'm working on my modernization and my unification of all my functionality, part of what I do is understand what I do really, really well. And then the things that I don't do maybe the best, is there a best of breed solution out there? I need to partner with on that and bring them in, right? And, and we do that over and over and over again. And sometimes those partnerships blossom and sometimes they fizzle out. But, but the whole point is optionality. I can't be everything to everybody as a provider. But what I can do is create an infrastructure that any financial institution should be able to use any parties, myself included, and others, pair them together to create the business model they want to go to the market with. That's the real key. I think that's a huge differentiator for Jack Henry is our position on openness and our willingness to be partners with competition to deliver the experience that each individual financial institution wants to, wants to have. So on the partnership side, and in, in specifically in small business lending, are, are we only talk about the specific companies, but are there partnerships that you say have been, and, and what's the characteristics of them? Because obviously for credit unions listening, right? Many credit unions are partnering directly with fintechs and, and trying to understand how to do that. So what what are the areas that you say is, well, let's stay in small business lending that are intriguing to you? And then what's the characteristics of that partner? What are you looking for? Yeah, so... So again, the open strategy doesn't limit me to certain areas, right? So it, the fact that I am open and we're building everything with APIs that, you know, other people can connect to, you know, that that's the whole, that's the gist of creating a, a broader ecosystem. But what I specifically look for with partners is, is number one, somebody that fills it, a known gap that I have, something that I know I know you need it. I can't do it. Right. Or I, I, I have to build it, you know, and the runways X, you know, whatever, whatever that is. But if there's a partner out there or, or another provider that does that or a financial, this is what, this is what happens 90% of the time. A financial institution calls me and says, Hey, do you work with such and such? Cause we saw their stuff and we love it. And I'm like, no, let me call. So we call and we figure out, and I, I try to understand what gap they're trying to close or what, you know, what, what they're doing to enhance a relationship and how that fits in my ecosystem. And then if, if it fits, then we, we figure out how we can work together to deliver that experience for a broader audience. Um, but if you look at, at like specific things, like uh, we have a partnership, I know with Autobooks, I know that's, that's a, a public one and that's, you know, working with small businesses and their accounting systems that they have to create 
you know, uniform uh, financials as well as funding through various avenues, right? So that that's an example of of, an, of a partnership. But then we have all types of things that we plug into our solutions to make them better. Um, you know, if you're opening accounts, we partner with third parties that do everything from identity verification to account validations to, you know, all kinds of things that, that you see um, uh, big data type stuff happen. Um, we plug them into our technology to make both parties better. Mm -hmm. So you, as you were talking, I was thinking about lending and deposits and, and, and what drives, which one drives the other, right? And uh, it's interesting. We had Chip Mahan, the CEO and chairman of Live Oak Bank, uh, on the podcast uh, back at back, I think it was back in August of twenty three, and it was very interesting, right? Yes, they're an SBA lender, uh, and Chip had just come off his Q two earnings call, and I'd listened to the call, and he had this really interesting fact that I thought was sort of out of characteristic for what was happening in the rest of the landscape, and that was that he he basically uh, you know declared to all of his analysts that hey. Our deposits are up 21%. Uh, that's almost $475 million of deposits in one quarter, right? Uh, where most most of the banks were seeing, still seeing asset flight. And he, did, he said, I did that by offering a business checking account, right? And the nature of his business is these are small businesses. They are doctors. They are lawyers. These are veterinarians who are trying to fund a practice. So he places it in that business checking account when he actually dispersed the loan. So it's a very interesting way to create very, very sticky deposits. And I always, you know, go through this chicken or the egg. What came first, right? The checking account or the auto loan, right? You know, the mortgage or the checking account. How do you see this? And strategically, how do you link? Because most of our clients do a great job. For example, credit unions, they're great indirect auto lenders. But they struggle really hard turning that into a true relationship because they define the relationship as, yeah, we opened the share account in order to create the membership to get that auto loan. But what about the checking account? What about the debit card? What about you know direct deposit of that paycheck? How do you see that bridge being connected? Do you see any best practices out there where folks are driving deposit growth through through lending? Yes, um, but I think we have to take a step back and understand what drive you know the basic business model for a financial institution which is we take deposits, which is a liability and cost us money. And the reason we do that is to make loans so that we can have an asset that drives interest. And the difference between the two is how we grow our institution to serve more people, right? So, I mean, that's the basic foundation of every financial institution created. So to me, structurally, the deposits precede the loans from a strategy perspective. Now you flip that to a consumer and, and the consumer very rarely is out shopping to where am I going to open my checking account, right? They're like, I need money for X. I need money for this. I need money for a house. I need money for a car. So they lead with their loan always. So that the two work counterbalance each other, right? So, so the, the, the financial institutions, customers are always going to lead with the loan and you're trying to catch the deposit on the backside of that. Whereas as a business strategy, you always want to have the liquidity available and then loan that out to make profit to then grow your, your overall institution. So, um, there's, there's many ways to skin that, that deal. And, and again, some institutions lead, uh, and, and are, and want to be known as a deposit generation tool. And then they're, they're off trying to figure out how to place that money to, to get profitability. Others, probably the, the more common is they outrun their deposits with their loans. Then they're back into the other funding sources, federal home loan bank, overnight funds, broker CDs, et cetera, et cetera, because they've outpaced their, their deposit growth with loan growth because they need the profitability to grow their institution. So it's, it's really a balancing act. And I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning. It's about having a defined strategy for your institution that is a long range plan. And then you, you figure out tools to use in the middle when you run into a roadblock that's created either economically or, or through some other outside influence.
Yeah, we used to say back in the days when I was at City, nobody wakes up in the morning and says they want to go City banking. They're buying a car, they're looking at homes, right? And then suddenly they wind up with a car loan and a mortgage. And and now your job as a good banker is to try to gather those deposits. But you're right, there's no easy solution. And I think you're you're right in as you characterize the extremes, right? We have folks that are really good asset gatherers, and then we have folks that are out there. Uh, doing a great job on on different channels, right? Acquiring acquiring loans. So, uh, so so as I was at the same conference this last year, uh, uh, it was interesting. Uh, they showcased three AI companies, and afterwards, and there were probably a hundred community bankers in this room. At the cocktail reception, you could not get near the three CEOs of these three startup. AI companies. Everybody's talking about it. It's pretty clear every every CEO of every financial institution has to answer back to their board what they're doing with AI. Now, you had a bunch of panel conversations. You had a payments conversation panel, I believe. You had another one on digital banking, and this was surrounding AI. And you know, we'll talk a little about pay rails, hopefully, in here. Uh, but what were the key takeaways coming out of those out of those panel conversations? Yeah. So. Um... AI is the new shiny object that will not go away. Oh yeah, everybody's grabbing it. It's yeah. not going to go away. That's here to stay. I mean, I'm not one of those that jumps on things super early, but this is one that I think is is monumental, um, and it's not going to go away. And, and it's not going to go away for the simple reason it brings too much efficiency to the table. Um, so. Um, uh, I'm I'm a, a loan guy from my beginnings, right? I, I've been all over financial institutions, but primarily in my heart, I'm a I'm a loan guy. And and where where AI really comes into play is the difference in um the approach when you're looking at how to handle a transaction. And I'm gonna use lending just as the specific example, but it can be applied across anything. In lending, you have two different schools of thought. You have you have the old gray hair guys and, and, and ladies that, that say lending is an art, right? It's an art that, you know, they're, they're the five C's of credit and da 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 right? And then you have the modern spin, which is it's a science, right? This is a science. We can run all this stuff through a machine and get the answer. We don't need the art, right? And the answer is, back to the extremes, it's neither. You need to bring together the art and the science. and That's where AI comes in. So AI has the ability to efficiently process the mundane data that you need to, to assess the art to, right? So often we don't get to do the art because we're too busy gathering enough data to make a decision. Whereas you can use AI to drive a lot of that data, to drive a lot of that those calculations and things to put in front of someone that that truly has the art of lending and can go oh based on all this data this is the right type of a scenario and again i'm being extreme there i'm saying use a machine to do this and use the person to do that but it's going to be a combination of all of those things to blend in the art and the science of lending now gary i always worry that obviously this is all dependent upon training data, right? You know, it is machine learning and we have to teach the machines. And the last, I don't know, decade, two decades, if I look at at, at credit performance and I look at where the interest rates were, right? Um, it was pretty clear sailing. And then we had this black swan event, right? Called the pandemic, which, you know, I, I hope we're not gonna have to model that over and over again, although we, we may, but, I always worry that the training data that's out there right now, it, it, it is not conclusive enough. It hasn't it hasn't had enough choppiness in it, right? For for us to feel comfortable that, wow, if I take this algorithm for underwriting, um, it it's really trained well enough uh, that it's found signal and it can underwrite better than anyone else can, right? Because you talk about it, right? The human touch is sensibility, right? Uh, I talk to underwriters all the time and, and chief lending officers, and they have a certain sensibility about their business. Now we're training this two-year-old, right? And we're, you know, I always say we're, we're training them to sale, 
but they never went out where there were choppy waters and they say, oh, they're, they're great sailors. And then suddenly there's a storm and they've never seen a storm. So you have that concern because we keep hearing people. Talk yeah, I do. And that was that exact scenario was experienced back in 2008, 2009. You remember that last disruption that we had brought in a ton of alternative lenders and they were truly booking loans on their balance sheet. They were balance sheet lenders, right? And, and they were doing, they were doing everything. With no, um, let me back up. They were doing everything with data points. Okay. They weren't bringing the art. It was a pure science. And what happened was, is to your point, there, there's not enough history there. There's not, there's not enough skint knees, so to speak, in that data to, to deal with that. So what happened is they all had to pivot because all, all the loans started going bad, right? And so they pivoted and became software providers. And they would, they, they, they did create disruption in the ability to, to electronically do transactions that traditionally were done manually in financial institutions, but they didn't have the science perfected, so to speak. And, and that then triggered uh, an event where they couldn't survive it on their balance sheet. So they flipped a lot of them and became software providers and went to large institutions and said, okay, let us bring our technology in with your balance sheet that you can handle this, this risk. And then we partner together and go forward. And I, and I think the same thing is, is, is here in AI today. We have to crawl, walk, run with AI. You can't, you can't go all in day one. I mean, to, to your point, everything's built on large language models. It's all about machine learning. And we have to continue to tune these tools to get the outcomes that we want. So it's interesting. I like the crawl, walk, run. You have a company. I have a company that we deal with every day. And and my my view is that we won't ever effectively use AI in, the, uh, in productizing it until we use it as individuals, employees coming to work every day, making ourselves more effective in our jobs. Um, so it, how do you see that, uh, Jack Henry? Are, do you see that in, a, in the same way where you, you try to get your employees to use it first so they understand it? Right. So at Jack Henry right now, we're establishing those guardrails, right? So, so it's the Wild West with AI. I mean, anybody that, I mean, just Google it, and then sit back and watch your screen flow, right? It's, it's the wild west. And, um, you know, literally there's probably no task you can't tackle somewhere with one of the, the, uh, public consumer AI tools that are out there. Um, chat GPT, the BARD model, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The, the problem with all of that is it wants to please you. AI is designed to provide you an answer, okay? So you got to be very careful that it's not just connecting dots that maybe shouldn't be connected because it wants to give you an answer because you ask it to, right? So what we have to do is utilize AI for framework. And then we have to bring our subject matter expertise in to complete the framework, right? So if you take a large task that has a a you know, multi-stage challenge of, of completing this task, you can ask AI to help you complete that task. Here's what I want you to do. And boom, it's going to spit it out. And you could turn a blind eye and say, okay, here's my answer and go. But, but the tools aren't good enough for that. The tools are great to give you that framework, but then I have to insert one of my people, a subject matter expert, that says, yes, yes, oh, we need to tweak that. Yes, yes, oh, we need to tweak that. You know, and we have to teach that and get it to the final refined product that we want. And I don't mean product that I sell, I mean output that I'm seeking in whatever task I'm trying to accomplish. And that's the real key. And to your point, I will absolutely wear this stuff out inside my own shop before I expose a single client to it. So, so let's talk about the shock to the system then. So in, uh, I think it was in 2022, uh, Jack Henry announced that you were going to acquire PayRails, right? So we've got this AI enabled payments platform. Uh, 
so here you are, you're, you're trying to build this in the foundational pieces, right? And the thinking of your staff as you productize AI. And now you, you purchase this company that comes with this you know, complete suite of products, right? Both, I think it's consumer as well as corporate payments. How does that, do these two things ever come together? How do they come together? Yeah. So I'm not a payrails expert. I'll start with that. That's, that's out of my, uh, out of my area of expertise there, but I can tell you again, my answer will be more philosophical. That's an example of, of looking at an opportunity, looking at a gap that Jack Henry knew they had acquiring people and technology to lift our entire brand, right? That that's what it's about. So, you know, it, it is about taking what they do best, bringing our culture, bringing our infrastructure, bringing, you know, the, the things that make Jack Henry, Jack Henry, bringing those two things together and, and one plus one equals three, right? Lifting the whole thing. And will, will all of us, you know, uh, ancillary tools or peers to payrails, will we learn from them? hundred percent. Will payrails learn things from Jack Henry? hundred percent. Right. So that's really where it is. And, and I think, I, I think you're spot on that, you know, that, that acquisition was two years ago, I think now, uh, and look where that was and where AI is today and where it's just imagine where it's going to be two years from now. That that's the, the scary part about AI is I can spend all day, every day on AI and not keep up. And you can tell I'm excited about it. I actually dig it. I like it. And I think it has a huge opportunity to help me do my job better, which is going to help financial institutions take care of their customers better. But man, it's a, it's a lot to digest. It's a lot to digest. And we have to do it in a manner that is safe and not get out over our skis. So Gary, if you think about the regulatory landscape and what's happening with AI, how do you see it evolving? And how do you see these companies navigating the regulatory environment? And as you saw, Zest AI now, Rodney Hood, who's the ex-chairman of the NCUA, is now a board member of Zest AI. So very interesting when you think about Rodney's position in financial innovation and Zest AI's position in providing underwriting tools using artificial intelligence. Yeah, so so we, we are obviously regulated by the same entities that our financial institutions are. Um, uh, we fall under all the FFIEC uh, guidance as well. And, and we continually communicate with those regulatory agencies uh, in an outbound manner. Okay. I mean, we're, we are, we as a company communicate in an outbound manner. We have associates that are assigned to maintain those relationships. And then conversely, we get the inbound, inbound requests as well. Uh, you know, we go through exams like everybody else goes through exams. So we have that constant communication of what's going on. So, so I'm not concerned there that the, if I had a concern about specific to AI and regulation, it's going to be how it, how, how are we as a tech provider and how are those examining bodies going to adjust their tactics based on that? Right. Um, you know, how are they going to adjust their process? to account for AI, because I, again, I don't think it's going away. I, I think it is here to stay. I, so we have to figure out the best way to harness it and use it in a safe and secure manner. I, I mean, obviously, you know, we're, we are not going to use any kind of an AI as a company and create any kind of a public access to personal data. I mean, it's just not going to happen. Right. So. That's, that's the number one thing as a provider we have to guard against. So any AI we use is going to be locked down so tight that, that you know, nothing can, can get out. So that's why we, when I say crawl, walk, run, the crawl part is how can we use AI and understand how it works with non-secure data? Let's start with that, right? Non-secure tasks, tasks that have no PII in them those sorts of things. And let's understand the value and how it can work. And then let's see how we can safely expand that into other use cases beyond it. I think the, the, the regulatory bodies are gonna have to do the same thing. How do they do things today? What are they seeing in the industry as far as how 
financial institutions, forget me, how financial institutions themselves are using AI um, and then how they're going to adjust their practices to account for that. Gary, do you, do you see the need to create special sort of, you know, we ever hear this conversation about back doors or tools for the regulators to actually examine because they can't see, you know, today they'll come in, right, in an exam, and they do it through our software as well, I'm sure through yours, right? They come in and examine a credit union or a bank, they select a bunch of loans, they take out the scorecard, they look at pricing, and they can basically do a desk exercise, right, and say, yes, we believe that we have a statistical significant enough sample to say that what your credit policy and what's happening in your scorecards is actually working, then they pull some stats out. When it's a black box, right? That's the big concern, right? We keep hearing this black box lending. So do you, do you do you see a need for special tools for for regulators to be able to do their jobs eff effectively? Um if if and when, right? This is like fully AI enabled underwriting. Uh I don't know if they'll need a, a back door to do that. I mean, again, this is just opinion. I'm just kind of thinking how to solve that problem. The, the black box, it scares me because I don't know what's in it, right? So I do not have a single solution at Jack Henry that's a black box. Everything I have is configurable by the FI based on policy, right? So so there is no black box. Jack Henry's not putting anything out there that says, adopt this thing, we'll give you the answer, right? It just doesn't exist because I, I, I personally don't want to dictate credit culture in a financial institution. That's my opinion. Um, but from a regulator side on institutions that do use a black box, I would think they'd focus more just on the outputs, right? And they're going to look at, at a stream of, of funded loans and they're going to look for deviations between protected groups and things like that. Um, I, you know, how they get to the end, I don't think is as important as the actual result. And, and if, if they find a deviation in the result, then they're going to start asking questions. And that's when the black box becomes a problem because you don't know how it made that decision. So that's, to me, again, if I'm running a, a, a shop of examiners, I, I would focus much more on the output than the process. That's great. Well, listen, we're going to leave it there, Gary. Thank you so much. Uh, I've enjoyed the conversation today. I uh, also want to thank all of our listeners and remind them to hit subscribe so you can enjoy future episodes. And I'll meet you back here in the next 22 Minutes in Lending. Thanks again, Gary. Have a great day.